<laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> We're just waiting for you. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get rid of the tiebreaker. I would like to call to order the October 16th, 18th, 16th meeting of the West Palm Beach Planning Board. Madam Clerk, if you kindly call the roll. Sam Fish. Present. Deborah Rain. Present. Peter Pifko. Present. Stephen Mayans. Present. Jean Marseille Jr. Present. Let the record reflect Patrick Mayfield and Will Caronte are not present. <laughs> So much. Next order of business is approval of the September 17th, 2024 minutes. Has <coughs> everyone had the opportunity to review them? Are there any changes or modifications? And if not, I'm looking for a motion for approval. I'll uh, move approval. Second. Mo motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is report of the planning staff. Ms. Van. Good evening, Chair, Board Members, Angela Van, Planning and Zone Administrator. Give you a quick update of the cases that have been heard since your last planning board meeting. Uh, resolutions number 199-24 and 2,200, excuse me, 24. Excess Court's dock. This was a request to construct two 205 foot long docks at uh, 5, 5210 and 5300. Excess Court is shown here. Waiver request was for an additional 105 feet. Um, you approved her this at your August 20th meeting and commission approved this on September 30th um, by a five to zero vote. The next one was for mechanical room and equipment height encroachments in CMUD. When staff increased the height for CMUD, uh, but we didn't change the height of mechanical equipment. The original was 50, 15 feet and we did amendment that you heard back in, uh, also on August 20th, to take that to 20 feet, which would mirror what the uh, DMP allows for encroachment of mechanical equipment into the height encroachment. And the commission also approved this on um, Tuesday by 4-0 vote. That concludes staff's presentation. Any questions? Any questions of staff? All right, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda are remarks by the chairperson. I just want to make one. People have things they love to do on their birthday. Being here is probably not one of them, but you, Marcel, I want to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we will sing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll spare them that. Uh, next is the declaration of ex parte communications. And let, let me begin by disclosing that with respect to planning board case 1979A, I received approximately 30 emails in opposition to the application. As to everything else, I have had no ex parte communications. I received no other written communications. I have conducted no investigations. I have made no site visits and I have received no expert opinions. I request that these disclosures as well as those 30 emails be made a part of the record. Does anyone else have anything to disclose? And let me start with you, Sam. As to planning board case 1979A, uh, I did have a Zoom call with the applicant. Uh, I also did receive the same emails, uh, 30 or, or so emails. Uh, as to anything else, I did not have any ex parte communications. I have not received any additional written communications. Uh, I did not conduct an investigation. I have not made a site visit. I did not receive any expert opinions. I request that these disclosures and all the written communications be made part of the record. And Sam, you need to affirm, as I failed to affirm, that we're gonna decide the case solely based on the evidence presented here tonight. I will uh, make any decisions uh, based solely on the evidence presented here today. As will I, notwithstanding the email. Jean, birthday boy. <laughs> <laughs> as to case 1979A, um, I did have a PowerPoint presentation from the applicant. I also received a um, couple dozen, if not more, emails uh, in opposition. Uh, my decisions will be based solely on the evidence presented tonight. Um, uh, 
other than those disclosure, disclosures, I have not had ex parte communications. I have not received any other written communications. I have not conducted an investigation. I have not made a site visit. I have not received expert opinions. I request that these disclosures and all written communications be made part of the record. Thank you. Peter. Um, I also had a Zoom conference call to, as an introductory to the project uh, planning board case number 1979A. <clears throat> My decisions today will be based on the information presented at this meeting. With regards to other items on the agenda, I have not had any ex parte communications. I have not received any written communications and I have not conducted an investigation. I have not made a site visit nor have I received expert opinions. I request that these disclosures and all the emails received and written communications be part of the record. Thank you, Deborah. As it relates to planning board case 1979, I did receive quite a few emails. Um, however, any decision I make tonight will be based on the evidence presented. I have not had ex parte communications. I have not received written communications. I have not conducted an investigation. I have not made a site visit. And I have not received expert opinions. And I requested these disclosures and all written communications be made part of the record. All right, thank you. That then brings us to the swearing in of speakers. <coughs> Would everyone who plans to speak or offer testimony this evening please stand up and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be truthful? Yes. Okay, thank you, you may be seated. Next on our agenda are continued cases of which there are none. That then brings us to planning board case number 1979A. May we hear from the applicant. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayans, Chairman Mayans, and the rest of the board. Um, my name is John Roach, and I'm an in-house certified urban planner with the Gunster Law Firm here in West Palm Beach. Again, certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners. We're excited about this opportunity to bring to you this evening the first development within the newly expanded uh, southern extension to the Curry Mix Use District. With me today are various members of our development team, but I'd specifically like to recognize Nicholas Perez, who's president of the Condominium Development for Related Group, who's the developer of the project before you this evening. The application is a level three special review with variances for the construction of the Ritz-Carlton residences. And as you're aware, the CMUD regulations provides that the planning board has the authority to grant all the site plans as well as variances within the CMUD district. The property uh, before you this evening is located on the west side of North Flagler Drive and approximately 195 feet north of South Lakeside Court. Overall, the project can, involves two parcels that are referred to as 1701 North Flagler Drive and 1717 North Flagler. They total approximately 2.55 acres. 1701 is occupied by a 58 unit multifamily development. It's income restricted and it is subject to an agreement with the Florida Housing Finance Corporation uh, that has many years left on its, uh, on its term. 1717 North Flagler contains three office buildings that total approximately 12,000 square feet. They've been vacated for some time. Um, a portion of them is currently being utilized as a sales center, uh, but the remainder of the building is vacant. As part of the proposed development, the existing 58 unit complex will remain, um, but a portion of its parking lot, approximately 0.42 acres, will be reconfigured and transferred to 1717, including the repairing property line on the east, or the repairing property on the east side of Flagler Drive um, that you see adjacent to the bulkhead there. While the transfer will result in the removal of some parking from 1701, it will continue to meet the CMUD requirements. The primary ingress and egress for 1701 as a result will transfer from Flagler Drive to an existing ingress egress on North Lakeside Court and that, uh, that ingress egress will be improved um, and additional improvements in working with the fire marshal will be made including additional hydrants, relocated uh, fire department connections, 
as well as we've worked with the uh, fire department on an on-site staging plan uh, as a result of that reconfiguration. The transfer will make 1717 more conducive for redevelopment in, in accordance with the approved vision for CMUD. The site is currently zoned as part of the expansion uh, that occurred several months ago, is currently zoned CMUD Core 1. Uh, the intent, as you know, of CMUD is to create a compact pedestrian oriented mixed use district, uh, specifically with Curry Park to the east, the Northwood Business District to the west. Uh, the Core 1 district is uh, typically the larger parcels located along the west side of Flagler Drive and is the centralized core of CMUD. The 1717 site uh, with the reconfiguration will be completely redeveloped. All the existing improvements will be scrapped from the property and redeveloped with a multifamily residential project consisting of 138 condominium units with associated amenities and 283 parking spaces within a structured parking garage. The building consists of three components. There's an eight story podium uh, you can see that here with the amenity deck on top. So the podium is outlined by this black line here. Um, that is eight stories with the amenity on top. There's an additional two-story component that has interior amenities on the west side of the tower and then the 18-story residential tower providing for a total of 28 stories overall and 306 feet. As you know, the City Commission made the policy decision as part of CMA to allow up to 306 feet of height on this property if certain incentives are, are met and we are within those regulations. The building complies with the required setbacks on three of its four sides. We are requesting a variance, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation uh, on the rear property adjacent to the 1701 parcel. But along Flagler Drive, the podium is set back uh, 15 feet off of the Flagler Drive property line. There's an additional 20 foot recess off of the edge of the podium for the residential tower, all as required by code. Recognizing the adjacent development to the north and south, we're actually providing three times the required setback. Uh, there's a minimum of five feet. We're proposing 15 between the north and south property lines and the podium. Again, that's three times what is required. In providing access to the development, we'll be removing five existing access points on North Flagler Drive and replacing them with a single pair of one-way drives. The northern driveway will be ingress only and the southern driveway will be for egress. Later in the presentation, I'll talk about the variance requests that we're, uh, we have in relation to this northern ingress point, uh, specifically as it relates to the separation from an existing driveway to our north. The narrower one-way drives not only makes for efficient circulation on the site, but is also uh, the safest as it reduces the width of the conflict uh, between pedestrians and vehicles, uh, specifically along the public sidewalk along North Flagler Drive. All the existing on, as well as provides for the most efficient uh, circulation pattern, which I'll go through in a second. All of the existing on-street parking in front of our property will be removed. Uh, it will be replaced with the landscape strip that you can see here between the, the public sidewalk and the North Flagler Drive uh, thoroughfare. Uh, this will allow for separation between pedestrians and vehicular traffic while also improving visibility for cars uh, entering and exiting not only our site but also existing driveways uh, that occur on adjacent properties. As I stated previously, the pair of one-way drives provides for the most effective and efficient circulation, uh, options for which were severely limited due to the east-west dimension of our property. Uh, this dimension is locked in by the existing restriction that's on 1701, so we couldn't extend our property any further to the west. Um, so we, we were really constrained when it came to looking at the, the layout of the internal circulation and the structured garage. As designed, the pattern is able to accommodate self-park, valet, as well as service vehicles, all within the confines and footprint of the building. Self-park vehicles are able to enter at the north end of the site and continue straight ahead onto the ramp uh, that goes to the upper levels of the garage. And then they can exit behind the lobby and through the egress point at the south end of the property. The valet operations will proceed, will come in the, the north entrance, uh, drop off and pick up area in front of the lobby. The valet will then be able to loop around the lobby to the garage 
and do a reverse operation in terms of the, the pickup maneuvering. They'll bring the car down, pull in front of the lobby, and then exit the site at the south end. Service vehicles are pretty similar to the self-park in that they'll continue straight ahead, but they'll proceed behind the lobby, be able to back into the loading space, and then pull directly out through the, uh, the southern egress. This is an overall rendering of the proposed development. As discussed previously, the building consists of the eight-story podium, which you can see here, uh, with an additional 18 stories above. While the podium does contain structured parking, it's entirely lined on its upper levels along North Flagler Drive with residential units. Uh, these wrap around the north and south corners of the building uh, and provide that active use, again, on those upper levels. The design incorporates a substan substantial amount of glazing throughout, integrating with the support columns, the concrete slab edges, and a continuous architectural band that you can see that wraps around the building. Um, and in addition to the active uses with the balconies, the podium also incorporates the required planar breaks uh, along North Flagler Drive. In developing the site and building massing, we evaluated the project's impact on adjacent properties, especially as it relates to the casting of shadows. So what you see here is um, one of the shadow studies that was done. I have a couple slides that relate to this. Um, on this slide and the one following, we show the shadows generated during the summer and winter solstices. Those two were chosen as they're the most extremes, the southern being the least amount of shadow that would be generated, and then the winter solstice being the most uh, shadow. Across the top of the slide, you can see the existing conditions. So you see Flagler Point, you see the 58 unit multifamily development, and then the existing office building. And you see this at 9, 12, 3, and 6 p.m. And then on the bottom, you have proposed showing the existing office building being replaced by the, by the, uh, the Ritz-Carlton Tower. As you can see during the summer solstice, uh, the shadows that are cast are pr primarily to our east and west. Uh, there's no shadows cast on the adjacent co condominiums, either to our north or to our south. During the winter solstice is when the shadows are the longest, as I indicated, and when we looked at the incorporation of our building into the site, we found that while we would cast a shadow onto the development to the north, the areas of greatest concern, you know, the common open space, the amenities, the pool area, and so on, were already actually in shadow as a result of their own building. The shadows generated by the proposed development would not be impacting these areas any more than that they experience from their own building today. So you can see here, again, this is the existing development, the times in which the, those areas in the horseshoe are shadowed, and then our proposed development added on top of that. Again, while we're casting a shadow onto their rooftop, uh, we're not providing for any additional impact <coughs> into their common area amenities. As mentioned before, CMUD regulations were revised um, to require uh, review and approval by the planning board. As part of that, um, the CMUD regulations are structured to include incentives uh, that will allow for an increase above <coughs> the base height. So you choose from an a la carte menu that's available in the code, and these incentives will allow you to extend up to the 306 feet in the case of core one. Uh, when CMUD South expansion was approved, there were a couple of additional incentives that were created as a result of that, and they were directed at specific issues that were identified within the immediate area along Flagler Drive. We've chosen to use these new incentives, new incentives as part of this project uh, as they have the greatest impact on the immediate area. So with the proposed development, there be over $1.9 million given toward the construction of seawall improvements along North Flagler, an additional $2 million towards roadway improvements on Flagler, and $950,000 contributed to the city's mobility fund to assist with various transportation programs. So in total, that's nearly $4.9 million of investment that will occur both in mobility as well as immediate improvements within the North Flagler corridor. As we talked about uh, review and approval by the planning board, but as part of that process, uh, the city recognized that there is flexibility needed within the CMUD regulations, and therefore they also granted the planning board the ability to grant variances as part of projects within CMUD and the other mixed use districts. As part of this, we are requesting uh, what I believe the city is classified as six variances, but they can really be 
clustered into four uh, components of the project, uh, just dealing with different sections of the code. The first is in relation to the required habitable space liner. While there's no requirement to provide an active use on North Flagler Drive, or this portion of North Flagler Drive, the city's code does require that 100% of the parking garage be lined by habitable space. Uh, we do provide residential liner units on the upper floors on Flagler. You can see those here. Those continue and wrap around the north and south corners of the building. However, with the constraints on the circulation that I described previously, uh, the lobby placement, elevator cores, and so on, the ground floor became much more difficult to achieve this, this requirement. The code would have required a 20-foot deep enclosed space right on Flagler Drive, 15 feet from the public sidewalk. You can see that shaded in red here. Because of the vehicular circulation pattern dictated by the site, this place would have been, the space would have been detached from the rest of the building's interior, and for any potential occupant, this is not desirable. Uh, with the significant grade change that we have to achieve as a result of floodplain requirements, it would have also been nearly impossible to meet ADA requirements um, given the, the finished floor elevation in relation to the sidewalk along Flagler Drive. So we started looking at different concepts um, as part of the um, alternatives that we could place within this area. Um, instead of it looking at, instead of looking at an enclosed space, we started exploring what if this space were open but still achieved the active requirement that the code was looking to uh, achieve. So in early discussions with the city, the concept ended with this open area display of public art, bench seating, landscaping that invites pedestrians utilizing the public sidewalk along Flagler. They can come in, they can sit, they can interact with the sculptures. It also gives a more open feel to the public realm, allows for a transition in grade from the sidewalk to the finished floor elevation, and also creates a nice feel and view from inside the space looking out to the intercoastal. While the ground floor does not have uh, an, active, an enclosed active space within the project, the detailed rendering that you see here depicts how this open active use space interacts with the public sidewalk, invites those pedestrians within and encourages that interaction as well as provides that seating. Vehicular traffic in front of the lobby is still screened through these architectural fens that you can see here uh, with the lobby uh, even behind that. And the rendering also shows the landscape strip that I was talking about before separating the pedestrian sidewalk from the North Flagler Drive corridor. Uh, important to note on this rendering, the shade trees, the street trees that are proposed haven't been removed just for the sake of clarity and to provide you that a better image of that active space that is proposed. The next couple of variances pertain to the horizontal encroachments on the upper levels of the uh, parking garage or the podium uh, in relation to Flagler Drive. With the limitations of um, creating the footprint needed for the parking garage and the liner residential units, on the upper levels, we wanted to create additional outdoor living area on the balconies and provide for the eyes on the street and increase the artic articulation along that facade. Currently, the code allows uh, an encroachment of five feet of balconies into the setback. However, that's not conducive enough for um, including tables and chairs and so on and, and truly having that active uh, outdoor space within that balcony. So increasing the depth of them to six feet, six inches would ensure the balconies are viable and enhance the pedestrian, or excuse me, the building's facade. This request only pertains to Flagler Drive, the east side of the building, um, which is open and, in open and unobstructed to the intercoastal and will not impact any adjacent properties. Uh, again, strictly limited to the east portion of the building. Underneath some of the balconies are decorative bands that wrap around that structure that I described previously and provide for a continuous design element throughout the tower as well as the podium. There are a couple areas which you can see here on at the top of the podium as well as at the top of the first floor where these bands span across those planar breaks. Um, so instead of them just simply extending below the, the balcony, uh, they do span this void here or that planar break. Um, therefore, they're more considered an architectural feature as opposed to just the balcony itself. Um, right now, the code limits architectural features to a two-foot maximum encroachment 
Uh, to pull these out to the same plane as the balconies requires that variance of four foot six inches. Uh, and again, it's really only in these four areas where it uh, spans that planar brick. This just shows those two concepts uh, as if you were looking from the, the south of the property, looking north at the south facade, uh, you can see the balcony encroachment six foot six inches with the bands below it. The next variance is with regard, or excuse me, it's variances four and five clustered together. This pertains to our shared property line between 1701 and 1717. As I mentioned, we did transfer acreage from 1701 to 1717. This did increase our north and south dimension. However, the property is still significantly constrained in comparison to the vision for CMUD when you look at it from an east-west dimension. Um, especially the fact that we have to maintain the restricted 58 units. Since both properties are owned by the developer, we looked at this rear property line as an opportunity to seek relief from the hardship uh, by, by providing a zero foot setback. Again, this wouldn't impact anyone other than ourselves and allow us to keep the increased setbacks on the north and south and would be no different than if the properties were, were consolidated together and redeveloped as one. In exchange for the relief, we'll remove over 3,700 square feet of asphalt on the 1701 parcel and replace it with landscaping, which includes palms, shade flowering trees, as well as shrubs and hedges. While located on the adjacent property, it will, the new landscaping will function as a buffer to the, uh, and provide screening, noise reduction, and visual enhancement between the existing and proposed buildings. This existing uh, multifamily building will be almost 17 feet from the proposed west facade of the new structure. And this is actually 50% um, additional separation than a 10 foot setback that is required by code. The new landscape area would be covered by an easement and maintenance agreement uh, requiring RITS to develop and install and maintain the landscaping in perpetuity uh, until such time if that site is ever redeveloped. Um, but until then, it would completely be the obligation of the Ritz project. The final variance pertains to the separation distance of the northern ingress driveway that I mentioned before, um, briefly within the presentation. As I did mention, it, we currently have five access points along North Flagler. We are proposing to reduce that to two one-way access points. So you'll have one ingress and one egress. One of the existing as, uh, access points that we're proposing to move is this one at the far north end of our property. Uh, currently, it's approximately three to four feet from Flagler Point's southernmost egress driveway. This will be closed off. So this is that our northernmost access point. This will be closed off and our new access ingress only is proposed to be 50 feet six inches from Flagler Point's driveway. The code allows driveways to be as close as 50 feet from a full roadway intersection. However, there's a requirement that they be 125 feet from another driveway, even though there's much, uh, a lot less and lower volumes on a driveway than there would be if it were a full intersection. I mentioned previously, the size of the property severely constrains our ability and options to accommodate the necessary on-site circulation. And so the provision of the one way, the two one way driveways has been studied and determined um, by our traffic engineer as well as the city's traffic engineer to be a safe and effective solution for pedestrians. I talk about the narrowness of the driveways by them being two one way as well as motorists by not, uh, again, by our traffic engineer as well as the city's. This design brings the site into a much greater compliance than what currently exists uh, in relation to the current standards and meets the separation requirements if Flagler Point's egress were considered as a full intersection with dedicated right way and so forth. Um, the application before you complies with all the applicable standards in the city zoning code and as we've outlined this evening and included in our justification statement, we're excited about this opportunity to bring another project to the Curry Mixed Use District, uh, the first within the southern expansion and we believe the project further implements the city's vision for the district. We've reviewed staff's recommendation as well as their proposed conditions of approval, and we have no objection to those. Uh, we appreciate your time this evening and we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Deborah. let me begin with you. Any questions of the applicant? Peter? 
I have a couple of questions. Are there any amenities um, on site that are open to the public, such as restaurants or spas? No, all the amenities, there's no commercial or non-residential space within the building. The only amenities are for the residents only. Okay. Um, and then the existing driveway uh, adjacent to the Flagler Point, is it egress? Um, the one that is there right now? Correct. It, it's not signed either way. Okay, so that's ingress and egress currently. It, it could be utilized for either, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, Sam, any questions? So, so <coughs> excuse me. Uh, as I'm looking at this map, you, you mentioned five uh, egress points from the current property, is that uh, trying to locate you yeah, have the so two. the existing ones we have this one that we talked about the parking lot for the office building has one here as well as one here there's this it actually used to be an old roadway that went through but it still has an access point that you can circulate in and out of or off of Flagler Drive and then there's this additional one here that is part of the land that is to be transferred so we have five access points that will be reconfigured into our two one-way Okay, no further questions right now. John, I had a couple quick questions. Um, can you can you put it back to the drawing where you, uh, that shows the access in and out? It was one of your first ones. At the very beginning? Yeah. You had a map that I thought showed it really well. It showed the circulation yeah, and everything. The, the yeah, that, line. that one's a good one, right I guess, here. right here. So the thrust of the complaints that I received on this project had to do with these, uh, the proximity of these two access points and the safety concerns. I wanted to first better understand what you could do of right today if we were to deny this application. What could you do with access and how is the safety of the proposed ones compared to what you could do of right? I will speak to the as of right and then as part of as a safety factor I'll have our city's traffic engineer come up and speak, or not the city's, but our right. uh, Kimley Horn's traffic engineer come up to speak on behalf of that. In terms of as of right, the code requires us to be 125 feet away from existing driveways. Uh, they have a requirement of being 50 feet away from an intersection. So because of, with Flagler Point's existing egress driveway, we would have to be 125 feet south of that to comply with the code. So you could not use, for example, the existing one now, the one that's adjacent to their property, for example. I just want to know what, what you could do of right and then compare it to what it is you propose and look at the safety considerations. For the record, Brian Seymour, okay. this is actually a legal question, and since I'm the lawyer, I'll answer it. Okay. Technically speaking, when you have an existing access point, if you don't have to reconfigure, it's there, it's there. Right. Right? So if we were to use what was there as part of the circulation, I don't think we would need a waiver because it's there. I suspect, by the way, that Flagler Point probably got a waiver when they got theirs approved to be that close because that drive's been there for a long time. So by right, your understanding is that you could use that the point of access northernmost and access. you could use any one of the five too i correct. mean of the other five correct okay then maybe appreciate that that's very helpful maybe to hear from your traffic engineer to compare the relative safety of what's being proposed versus what you could do of right because that seems to be the thrust of the neighbor's concern is their concern that what's being proposed won't be safe Uh, good evening, for the record, Chris Hagen with Kimley Horn Associates. My address is 477 South Rosemary Avenue, uh, Suite 215 in West Palm Beach. And I was sworn in at the beginning of the hearing. Uh, you know, first of all, just wanted to speak briefly to, the, uh, to those. Um, it, it, I think they, uh, both John and Brian, adequately addressed you know, as of right. But I also wanted to point out that um, this really represents the minimum access request feasible for the entire site because it's in, it really instead of it, we would it allows just one point of ingress and one point of egress period um, which is really the minimum that we could be requesting from Flagler Drive the just the differences in order to maintain circulation which is it's a very common uh, configuration for 
for a site to have, you know, to separate the inbound and in, uh, ingress and egress um, driveways, Flagler Point to the north does the same thing. They've got a one-way circulation system. You look at other condominium buildings, especially in order to provide the, the pickup and drop-off area for the lobby area for residents, et cetera. It's, uh, it, it really um, is important and, and most beneficial really to separate those, those out to pro, you know, in order to, uh, to provide for that pickup drop-off area. As far as safety goes, I, I think the most critical uh, aspect for any driveway is ensuring that the uh, site distance triangle is provided for and maintained because that's really uh, the, the most critical um, you know, issue for anybody entering or exiting a driveway. And you know, that was part of the site plan review process. So the adequate site triangles for drivers to be able to see is provided for uh, in this example. And one last thing I wanted to, to uh, related to safety is John alluded to this in the presentation. The city's code uh, uh, has different spacing criteria for the minimum distance from a driveway, you know, between driveways, and then also minimum distance from a driveway to a full intersection. Uh, between driveways, it's 125 feet. The minimum distance uh, that's required from a driveway to an intersection on this classification of a road is 50 feet. And the city wouldn't have that in the code if that were unsafe. So this is being provided if if uh, Flagler uh, points egress were actually a, uh, a public roadway, we wouldn't be here requesting this, uh, this waiver because the 50 foot minimum is, is met. It's just the fact that it's a driveway instead of an actual intersection. But again, the city code wouldn't have that in there if, if 50 feet were, were unsafe because that's allowed from a, from a corner of an intersection to a driveway. So in your professional opinion, if the alternative were to have one major entrance that combine both ingress and egress, as opposed to having them separate as proposed, what is safer? No, because we, you're not really um, changing the, the uh, number of uh, conflict points. Uh, because if you had one, if you combine them, you would still have the same number of conflict points, which is you know a left turn in, a right turn in, a left turn out, a right turn out. That, that doesn't change. You do move it. it, it I guess the, the question is moving it further from the, uh, the Flagler Point driveway, um, but again, because adequate site triangles are provided for, uh, there's, there's adequate visibility for drivers to be able to make those maneuvers, and, and that, you know, again, it, it meets a, a criteria that's deemed safe for a, for a you know, so, so I, corner clearance. I just want to be very clear yeah. on what your opinion is. Is your yeah. opinion there's no difference, or there's a favorable distance, or unfavorable but manageable? With, I, with what's being proposed. Yeah, well. I, I don't really see any difference in, in the safety because it really meets uh, the, the minimum. I, I don't think that it, it really <coughs> changes the, the facts. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. Right. Quick one. Um, would you also agree that uh, by removing of the street parking also aids the safety of the both driveways? Yes, uh, so currently, uh, as was presented in, in the presentation, uh, there there's pavement from the, the edge of the curb all the way through the travel lanes. That's, that's solid pavement. There is no landscape strip. And uh, vehicles uh, historically have parked there. Uh, and that does, parking, on-street parking um, can uh, negatively impact sight triangles like I was talking about. And again, today with, I, I would definitely say it's safer than today's condition because there's the on-street parking which can uh, can block that, plus the five uh, access connections that are close, more closely spaced than 50 feet um, is definitely less safe than, than what's being proposed. But, but yes, the on-street, removal of the on-street parking enhances the, the visibility for drivers using the, the driveways. Thanks. Any other questions? Go ahead, Jim. This might be a question for uh, Mr. Seymour. Um, if the applicant were to uh, construct uh, a project and left the current um, driveway that's adjacent to Flagler Point, could they use that? Um, or would construction of a new site require redevelopment of the uh, ingress and egress? So permitted access point, oh sorry for the record again, Brian Seymour. I was also sworn, I don't think I said that earlier. Um, so when you have a permitted existing access point, the only time you can't use it is when you do something like this where you reconfigure. If we were to 
for instance, ha have it would be a horribly inefficient design. But if we had, for instance, and I'm going to use the mouse if this will work, um, gone up through the existing access point here, come around and then in, then there would be no request because it's already there. Mm -hmm. So the new construction would not trigger a need to change that if you incorporated it? Correct. Through. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? If, and if not, may we hear from staff. Good evening, Linda Louie, Principal Planner for the record. Um, so this is Planning Board case number 1979A or SP-2404429. It's a request by the applicant for a level three special review with six variances from the zoning code. Um, the requests are being made to provide for the residential development within the Curry Mixed Use District. But, but before I begin my presentation, I just want to make clear that it's important to note that the planning board makes a final decision tonight uh, for the special review as well as the variances. Um, it does not require city commission approval, so the planning board vote is final tonight. Um, so just to quickly go over the background, the affected area is comprised of 1.15 acres. It's located within the Curry Mixed Use District and has a Core 1 subdistrict zoning designation. The Core 1 subdistrict um, allows for a maximum building height of 306 feet with the applic application of the district's height bonus program. So as mentioned by the applicant's presentation, the applicant is seeking approval of the Level 3 Special Review pursuant to Section 9455B of the Zoning Code. Um, this is to provide for a 306 foot tall, 26 story residential development. Uh, the proposed development consists of 138 units, 283 internal parking spaces, which meets the minimum requirements for the development, and a publicly accessible sculpture garden located at the project's frontage along Flagler Drive. In order to provide for the proposed development, the applicant will be utilizing the height bonus program as well as requesting the six variances. Uh, so just to quickly summarize how the height bonus program works, I won't go into much detail because uh, the applicant has um, you know, um, gone over how it works. Uh, through the height bonus program, the developer can obtain the additional building height by selecting from a list of incentives identified in the Curry Mixed Use District regulations. There are 13 incentives to choose from, uh, so the developer has the flexibility to choose the incentives that would get the project the desired height. So each incentive um, is designed to provide a public benefit in exchange for the additional height. So as you can see in this table here, I won't go over them because the applicant had specified which three incentives the project will be utilizing. Um, this column here identifies the height bonus that would be achieved with each uh, option, and this is the required contribution by the developer in order to achieve that height. So the cumulative amount to be paid for by the developer for the additional height is approximately $4.9 million. Uh, so the variants requested for the proposed development are detailed and analyzed on page 16 through 25 of the staff report, but just to quickly summarize, there are six variances for the proposed development, which are all listed on the slide. The only correction in the staff report is with regards to variance number six on the slide. It's the minimum distance separation between the access points for the northernmost access point. So in the staff report, the provided distance separation if, is 50.4 feet, but it needs to be corrected to 50.5 feet. So staff is off by a tenth of a decimal. And this correction would also increase the provided distance separation um, and also reduce the variance request from 74.6 to 74.5 feet. The variance requests 
are necessary to minimize the impact um, to minimize the impact of the proposed development to the surrounding properties and to provide for a more efficient design. Um, the analysis for the requested variances are provided on pages 25 through 28 of the staff report, but in a nutshell, staff has found that the variances complies with the required variance standards in section 9438D6 of the zoning code with the conditions provided in staff's recommendation. As for the level three special review standards, which analyzes the proposed development based on four standards relating to the context, circulation and traffic flow, building design and public realm, staff has found that the proposed development complies with the special review standards of the zoning code with the conditions also provided in the staff report. Uh, the analysis for the special review standards are also detailed in, on pages 28 through 30 of the staff report. In terms of project review, the Plans and Plats Review Committee initially reviewed the project at its January 11th, 2024 meeting and has deemed the project sufficient to move forward to the planning board. Um, traffic concurrency was also issued by the Palm Beach County Traffic Division on October 2nd and a school concurrency letter was issued by the school board on June 6th. Based on staff's findings and analysis, staff is recommending approval of the variances with the conditions outlined in staff's recommendation as, as staff has found that uh, the variances complies with the variance standards of our zoning code. And staff is also <coughs> recommending approval with conditions of planning board case number 1979A SP-2404-0029. And those conditions are also provided in the staff report as staff has found that um, the special review complies with the special review standards of our zoning code. Um, so these are the conditions that are provided in the staff report. Um, two minor um, modifications and the first one is related to the conditions for the variance. It's uh, condition number two and that's the correction based on um, the distance separation that's provided it's um, off by a tenth of a decimal point as I had mentioned earlier in my presentation as for the special review conditions uh, the only modification is to condition number seven and it relates to the maintenance agreement uh, staff is deleting the last sentence um, as the planning board does not have the authority to authorize the mayor to sign a maintenance agreement. So that is being deleted from the condition. Um, to conclude staff's presentation, uh, staff has received a number of objection letters from the property owners at Flagler Point, which is the residential development immediately north. Um, the letters as of 12 p.m. yesterday have been um, added to your planning board packets and the, all the objection letters to date um, have been printed out for the board members to review and it's been presented in front of you tonight as printed documents. But the total number of letters received, objection letters received from the residents is 47. And that concludes staff's presentation. Any questions of staff? Let me start on this side. Sam, any questions of staff? I have a question on the uh, the requirement I have the 125 feet mm -hmm. um, separation. Yes. Do we have? Do we know that when that went into place, or when the the city would have adopted that uh, the regulation in the zoning code? It was before my time. Uh, it's a general distance separation requirement, and it's typically analyzed as an ingress egress point. This particular distance separation that the um, applicant is seeking as a waiver or a variance has been reviewed by the city's traffic engineer and um, there are no issues with it. Um, it was deemed safe. Um, you know, it was thoroughly analyzed by the city's traffic engineer based on the trip generation associated with the proposed development. There's, gonna, there's no conflict with the location of the access point with the existing access point to the north. It's also reducing a nonconformity by reducing the number of access points from five to two. So uh, as of when it was adopted, I'm not sure, but based on the analysis for this particular project, um, it, it's, it's not a concern. So I think, I think the Steve, you brought up a good point that 
uh, that plague by point would have had to have the same variance, or a, I guess even a, a, a bigger variance if the access point next door, was it three feet or five feet they mentioned? Five. Was that something like that? Um, it it's looked it's quite less close. than five feet. The existing access point is less than five feet. So as you can see in this image right here, this is the existing condition. This is Flagler Point's access point, and this is the existing um, access point to the site. Does, does the 125 feet only pertain to a neighboring property, or would it pertain if to the two access points that the proposed development would also have? It, it would apply to any new development. So anytime there's a new development, it would have to meet the minimum distance separation from any existing, um, whether it's proposed within the, f the affected area or adjacent access points that are existing. So every access point would have to be 125 feet from Correct. the next access point? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Gene, any questions of the applicant? Peter, any questions of the applicant? Uh, Linda, in your testimony, you said that the city traffic engineer re reviewed the plans. Yes. Any concerns with the location of the driveways? No. I mean, it is conditioned in um, the staff report that it's limited to ingress, e ingress only, so it's inbound traffic only. Um, that's, um, and I had this conversation with her this morning that that provides for a more organized traffic circulation within the area. Um, but keeping it as an inbound lane only is not a concern and it does not create any traffic conflicts with the existing access point to the north. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Peter asked my question. I'm so sorry? Peter asked okay. my question. Um, just one question of you, and I think you really answered it before, but I just want to give you one more chance if you wish it. You're aware of the concerns of some of the neighbors with regard to the safety. Is there anything you want to add to address their concerns? I think you've addressed a lot of it, but I just want to give you a chance to add anything you can think of before we hear from some of the neighbors. Like I had mentioned that um, the access point uh, variance seems to be the biggest concern. Um, you know, I did mention or state that the traffic engineer did look at the circulation as well as the distance separation carefully. We've had multiple discussions. My latest one happened this morning just to make sure that um, there are no major issues regarding this and she assured me that there is no conflict with the placement and distance separation of the access point as, no, as presented in the site plan. Thank you so much. Okay, at this point we're gonna um, here from the public. I have five cards, two of which are written out. Um, they do not wish to speak, but they want me to read their comments into the record. And then I have three other. If you, if I, when I call your name, if you, if you wish to speak and you have not filled in a card or heard your name, please bring a card up to the clerk so we can hear from you. I'll read the comments of the record last, but the three people who wish to speak I have are, uh, Gene Jetter and Associates, uh, Charlie Simon, and um, Carrie Mead. If you could come forward to either one of these two podiums who wish to be heard. These are cards from people who asked to speak. You're not obliged to, but this is your opportunity to, should you wish to do so. Doesn't matter. You can. The, the order doesn't matter. So I just want to call. In your name, ma'am. My name is Carol Mead. Okay, Carol Mead, and Carol Simon. Are you here? Yes. Why don't you step up to this podium, ma'am? And then you, the other one, uh, Cheryl. Cheryl are, are you wish to be here too? Yes. Please come forward, and you can take one of the podiums, and let's hear from you, ma'am. If you could begin, you have three minutes. Yes. Uh, let me first start by saying I live at Flagler Point. And what they are referring to as, as an ingress driveway is an alleyway behind the building. It is not an existing throughway. Traffic does not go there. It's an alleyway behind the building. So just keep that in mind. Uh, my name is Carol Mead. I live at Flagler Point. Uh, you have seen 47 emails. I have also a petition here with 80 plus signatures opposing uh, this case number 1979A, separation of an access point. 
The city of West Palm Beach has been putting the residents of Flagler Point at risk for the last two years by allowing variances and exceptions to the existing building and safety rules. We now have three major construction projects surrounding us, a 20 plus year old building, uh, which puts us at an extremely high risk for structural integrity issues already. You're now considering to putting Flagler Point residents at further risk by allowing an additional variance to a rule which has stood in place for decades to protect the safety of West Palm Beach drivers and pedestrians. I have given to you a paper which cites the Transportation Research Board and National Research Council, which has uh, presented research on uh, driveway and street intersection spacing, uh, specifically right turn overlap. Um, most Flagler Point residents take a right out of there. And so to say that there's no conflict, uh, this is right turn, you know, right turn conflict overlap findings. Uh, it says that uh, drivers need to be alert for turning vehicles one driveway at a time. And the literature that speaks about right turn conflict overlap specifically says that it needs to call for adequate separation of conflict points. If you look at the chart, the adequate conflict points state that where we are at 30, 30 miles per hour on Flagler Point as it stands today, and that would be if people actually did 30 miles per hour, which we know they do not, that the minimum requirement would be 100 feet for safety. This is the National Transportation Safety Board. So look at you need to think about reducing the current traffic, traffic safety minimum requirement down to 50 feet from 125 feet. That's not more than a fewer car lengths and it puts us at serious risk for all drivers and pedestrians in the area. The property is a very high risk stretch of Flagler Point. There was a pedestrian killed in that area just several years ago, a short distance from where we're talking about because people do speed in that area constantly. We know that. Flagler Point uh, uses that uh, our driveway as an egress point. All of our vendors who are vans, moving trucks, they all have to go out that way, and I guarantee most of them are taking a right. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Are you here for you? And ma'am, you could come to this other podium. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Carol Simon, and I also am a full-time resident at uh, Flagler Point. Uh, I've been asked to speak by many of the residents and I share their feelings that Ritz-Carlton wants the city of West Palm Beach to change the city's zoning and planning development regulation Z1DR 94-32 parentheses 2 parentheses 3 which mandates 125 feet between driveways down to 50 feet. This will allow Ritz-Carlton to have a new design with more housing and save money. So, what is more important? To allow Ritz-Carlton to have a new design for more housing and save money or endangering the people who use North Flagler Drive? Voting in favor of Rich Carlton's request will be allowing the people to use North Flagler job as well as endangering them, hurting them, possibly disabling them, or even possibly killing them due to an auto accident. This could be your child, your brother, your sister, your aunt or your uncle, your mother, your father, your grandfather, or even your grandmother. So what you need to decide tonight is to either allow Ritz-Carlton to save money or to save a person from getting hurt, disabled, or possibly killed on North Flagler Drive. It's your choice. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Cheryl Jeter, and I'm here today on behalf of AN Associates, a local business in West Palm Beach. Unfortunately, our CEO couldn't make it this evening, but I'm here to represent us, okay? Um, I want to express why I'm here for, the company, for our company's support of the Ritz-Carlton Project. We have attended many of the project's outreach meetings, and we have delighted, and are delighted that, and are delighted and demonstrated support 
and com commitment to related group in reaching out to local residents in the North End, Pleasant City, and Coleman Park areas. Y'all pardon me, because I don't have my glasses. <laughs> yeah. um, related group has listened to the residents, identified community needs, and remains committed to addressing those needs. Um, they have gone over and above the requirement to engage in our community. We look forward to working with them in the future and let the record reflect that our company supports Rips Carlton's project. I thank you okay. so much. Thank you. I have two cards who have comments that I've been asked to read into the record. One is from Sandra Marchman. I was not very clear about that. I'd like to oh, please come forward, ma'am. Uh, then I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself. And the other one is Roar. Uh, Roar Trolley. Are, are you? Yes, you did. Oh, I'm so sorry. The, I had a separate card from Roar. It looks like it's it's hard to make out the Rose Trolley. Is Rose Trolley here? Well, let me read the comments and then you'll have a chance to speak. Rose Trolley appreciates the commitment to reach out to local residents and local businesses we support the development of the ritz carlton and hope that the communication will continue throughout the movement of this project okay ma'am i'm not gonna read your comments because you're gonna okay speak my name yourself. is sandra marchman excuse me ma'am forgive me before you begin is there anyone else after this lady who wishes to speak who's not been called if you could pull out a card and give it to the clerk go ahead ma'am okay um i i own the property at 318 north lakeside court and for 40 years and so I've seen the traffic on that little bitty street come and go. And it, because of the um, condominium down at the bottom of Flagler Street, it's been closed off. However, I can just see during the construction where that gate's gonna get open or it's gonna get open and it's, traffic's gonna be coming back and forth on that street. Because if it's crowded and construction's going on, they're gonna need places to come in and out they're gonna take the line of least resistance. Mm -hmm. Our street cannot take that. It's little, it's bumpy, it's really bad already. I just guess I would like you to consider paving, straightening that street up before it gets used, and perhaps if the traffic gets bad enough, coming in and out of it yeah, onto Dixie Highway is a nightmare to begin with, and maybe a, some type of a temporary traffic control and the other thing is making certain sure, um, in my property I've already been, there's been a fire, major fire twice and a major problems with getting emergency vehicles in there. That's my comment. Right, Just so consider much. it when we're doing that. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Hello everyone, my name is Liz Mooney and I live in Northwood. Um, I've really been anticipating this project for a long time now. Um, as I've lived in the neighborhood a few years. I believe the Ritz Carlton residence is gonna promote local growth, um, help support small businesses, particularly in Northwood Village that many times people overlook, but it's wonderful. Um, and overall make West Palm Beach more vibrant, safer, prosperous place to live. So I'm really eager about this project and excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. And Fran, a person <coughs> chick, you wish to be heard? Oh, we become, okay, sure. I am opposed to the relocation request for the variance to move the um, driveway closer to Flagler Point. This would be very dangerous for traffic, okay? Anyone else wish to be heard first from the public who has not been heard? All right, thank you. Does the applicant want you to add something before we take it under advisement? Yes, thank you, Mr. Maines, again, for the record. Brian Seymour on behalf of the applicant. So, um, First, I just I want to address Ms. Ms. Marchman. Um, uh, someone will come see you before we leave, get your number. We will talk about the maintenance of traffic, all the construction issues. We'll be happy to discuss with you. Those are things we definitely will look at. Uh, we can't, I mean, we don't pave the city streets, but we can certainly um, talk about some of those issues and make sure that uh, we're thinking about that ahead of time. To, to, yeah, we, right, we you, appreciate we, that, yeah. wanted to let her know that. Right. Um, the other thing really quickly is the document that Ms. Mead referenced. So that was a study from 1996. So 30 years, there's lots of things that have changed, obviously. 
but, but it's, you have to actually read the paragraph underneath the chart, the first full paragraph. And it actually talks about how to do that. So if you read the paragraph, there's an example. And it says, if, for instance, you have 300 feet, and you then have to divide that by the number of driveways, so the distance would be 150. So in this case, she is correct, it would be 100 feet based on the 30 mile per hour, divided by two driveways, now you'd be at 50 feet. So it actually, even in the 1996 scenario, would still meet the text, right? You have to read the whole thing, which is what that says. Frankly, it's, very, it's a totally technical issue, and I'm not qualified to talk about the whys, right? That's why Mr. Hagen got up and talked about all the traffic, right? So today, 2024, this has been reviewed, current standards, current cars, all the, the new safety features and everything else that goes into this. But I thought it was worth noting that even almost 30 years ago, following the text, you'd actually be at 50 feet. So, um, and again, the adequacy is, is reviewed by the traffic engineers. This is a highly technical issue, so I'll leave that. The only other thing was um, the money. This is about money, it is not about money. I talked about how there could be different configurations. Mr. Hagen talked about different configurations that wouldn't make a difference. It would just make for more difficult traffic flows. So this is not a, a variance request based on money at all, as uh, Mr. Hagen, Mr. Roach, and, and Ms. Louie all talked about. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we bring it back to the board for discussion. Um, does anyone have any general thoughts for a motion, either pro or con? Anyone want to share anything? Um, um, if, if not, I just want to make a couple observations myself. Um, um, take very seriously the concerns of the neighbors about safety. Um, and I appreciate the lady's comment that this is an alley. But in fact, what it is, is a legal access. And that's what we're talking about here today, a variance of access. There is legal access right next door to your community. It may be an alley today, but legally, without coming to us, they could make that one of their main points of ingress and egress. Mm -hmm. This seemingly is a major improvement because it's much further away. It's also divided, ingress, egress, separated. The parking is being eliminated, which is also, I'm well familiar with this space. My own home is extremely close, closer than you may think to this project. I'm well familiar with that stretch of Flagler Drive. And with the parking removed and the ingress and egress separated and being pulled further away than that other access point, the evidence that's presented to us by the two traffic engineers support this. And we're bound to follow the evidence that's been presented. So those are my observations. Does anyone have concerns uh, with regard to this project? I do have one thing to Go say, ahead, as you talked about the egress and the ingress, as yes. and they reduced the different access points. Um, I don't know if it was in the traffic engineer's report, but I see it as I was reading it, that it would improve safety and cut down on congestion. I think that's what I get from it. I do um, take into consideration all of the emails sent. I, I did read each one I received, but I also went over the traffic engineer's report. And so having those, what was it, five, and then you cut them down, to two. it's gotta be some improvement. And divided. Yeah, mm -hmm. and divided. Mm -hmm. And that was a very good point you brought about the parking. Right. As well, because yeah. I'm familiar with that dead block. That was key. That was key, I think. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I wanted to ask: like, uh, removing the parking is was the parking area owned by the property, or was it on city? It's street parking, my understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the deal here is they're going to landscape that, <coughs> use it, so it's not going to. There's not going to be all street parking allowed there, which blocks visibility. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've driven by there many times, and I've come out of that building before, and and note it's a it's a huge issue. I, is the parking owned by the property itself, or is it on it's the city? city? So the city is requiring. My understanding is street, that, street that, that part of this. You want to address that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, the on-street parking is within city right-of-way, so um, it is not on private property. And 
whether or not it can be removed can be managed at site plan approval. But, but this, this um, what's been proposed, the city is supporting, right? Uh, staff would support that, yes, for sure, because it does create a safer traffic conditions with the proposed project. Okay, thank you. Does that address your question? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, uh, then I'm looking for a motion. All right. I'll move that the planning board grant <coughs> the variance to the city zoning and land development regulations as listed in the staff report with the corrected dimensions dated October 16, 2024, <coughs> associated with planning board case number 1979A, SP-240-40029 and request for Brian Seymour and John Roach of Gunster on behalf of 1717 North Flagler Drive Venture LLC. This motion is based upon the testimony presented at the hearing along with the application submitted and the staff report, which constitute competent substantial evidence. The planning board hereby makes finding a fact that the applicant complies with all the applicable criteria in Article 2, Section 94-38-D6 of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations. We have a motion. Have we a second? Second. Motion and second. So we so sorry, condition. Condition. No, next, next one. Sorry, forgive me. <laughs> Continue. You want to do it together? Mr. Thomas, is this a combined You want to separate or? Do we separate? The variances. But you want a separate motion for that? Oh, no. You have to include the conditions. I'll move it just in case. Okay. <coughs> I move that the planning board grant the variances to the city's zoning and land development regulations as listed in the staff report dated October 16th, 2024, associated with planning board case number 1979A, SP-240-40029, and requested by Brian Seymour and John Roach of Gunster on behalf of 1717 North Flagler Drive Venture LLC. This motion is based on the testimony presented at the hearing, along with the applicant submit, submitted and the staff report, which constitute competent substantial evidence. The planning board hereby makes finding a fact that the application complies with all the applicable criteria of Article 2, Section 94-38D6 of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations. Second. And? And is there more? I think that's it. There is, a, is there another one? Oh, okay. <coughs> I move that the planning board grant planning co board case number 1979A, SP 2404029. Well, the second paragraph, the condition. Oh, unmodified? Okay. You don't want this one? Conditions imposed. Okay. Yes. Oh, the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <coughs> Uh, Flagler Drive Venture LLC, the approval of a level three special review for the construction of 138 unit multifamily residential development generally located at 1701, 1717 North Flagler Drive as presented to the board. This motion is based upon the testimony presented at the hearing along with the application submitted in the staff report, which constitutes competent substantial evidence. The planning board hereby makes finding of fact that the application complies, we should the applicable special review standards found in sections 94-55 B2 of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations. In addition, this recommendation is made subject to the conditions of approval contained in the staff report dated October 16th, 2024 with the corrections of the dimensions. I move that these conditions are necessary to ensure compliance with the purpose of intent of the zoning regulations and land development of regulations consistent with the comprehensive plan of the city of West Palm Beach. Do you mind repeating that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Deborah, <laughs> do you accept the um, uh, changes to the original motion so we have a, a, I a second. second? Okay. Motion and second. Any further discussion? If not, all those. Can we wait for counsel? I'm so sorry. Did he need to read the... Um, Conditions that were imposed regarding the landscaping, so on and so forth. What do we, what do we need? Mm -hmm. Well, you approve my moving. The motion to approve the variance mm -hmm. and the conditions of the approval of the variance. Didn't he do that all? Mm -hmm. 
Which one? Man, you show me some of that okay. film when I see you see it. This is Grand Indian yeah. Theater. Yeah, is that one? Grand Indian Theater. Yeah, in conditions we like. Yeah. You read it. I think you read it already. In addition, I just read it. So that I thought you read the one for approving the level three. Uh, that was my second motion. This is the, s the second. The first one so is up here, right? Okay, so the Sorry. director is here. So Brent, you know the directors? Okay. And, then the and then that one, yeah. Here. Yeah. Of Brent's plan, yeah. Well, this I didn't read because that's you not you here. You could just reference them. Okay, that, that's not here. That's why. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So continue on. Help. <laughs> Angela Van Penn and his own administrator. The variance is one separate vote. You need to do the variance yeah, with the conditions as amended by staff and then do the special review. It's another vote with conditions as amended by staff. With the conditions as amended by staff. Okay, but that wasn't on the on the screen, that's why. <laughs> I only read what's on the computer. That's what they pay me for. Yeah. <laughs> so the so All right. The record is clear. Yeah. Do that one I did. Motion, then do the so you want me to do it again? Yeah. Okay. So I told him he should repeat it. <laughs> Just to make sure. I move at the plate for the fourth time. I move that the planning board grant a variance to the city zoning and land development regulations as listed in the staff report dated October 16th, 2024, associated with planning board case number 1979A. SP-240-40029 and requested to Brian Seymour and John Roach on Gun of Gunster on behalf of 1717 North Flagler Drive Venture LLC. This motion is based upon the testimony presented at the hearing along with the application submitted in the staff report, which constitutes competent substantial evidence. The planning board hereby makes finding of fact that the application complies with all the applicable criteria in Article 2 Section 94-38, D6 of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning, Land Development and Regulations. In addition, <clears throat> the granting of these variances is made subject to the following restrictions, stipulations, and or safeguards that I move are necessary to ensure compliance with the purpose and intent of the Zoning and Land Development Regulations and consistent with the comprehensive plan of the City of West Palm Beach. Item one deals with the landscape easement Item two deals with the vehicular access point approval of 50.5 feet. And that's it? Two of them? Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay, that's the motion. Deborah, do you second? Okay. Yeah. Motion and second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Now, is there a second motion that needs to be made, Mr. Thomas, on this? I'm so sorry. Is there a second motion we need? Yes, okay. Level three site plan. Do you know what this is? Okay. I move that the planning board grant planning board case number 1979A SP2404029, a request by Brian M. Seymour and John P. Rhodes of Gunster on behalf of 1717 North Flagler Drive Venture LLC the approval of a level three special review for the construction of a 138 unit multifamily residential development generally located at 1701 and 1717 North Flagler Drive as presented to the board. Never mind. This motion is based upon the testimony presented at the hearing along with the application submitted and the staff report which constitute competent substantial evidence. The planning board hereby makes findings of fact that the application complies with each of the applicable special review standards found in section 94-55 parens B parens 2 of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations. In addition to this recommendation, in addition this recommendation is made subject to the conditions of approval contained in the staff report dated October 16th, 2024. I move that these conditions are necessary to ensure compliance with the purpose and intent of the zoning and land development regulations and consistency with the comprehensive plan of the city of West Palm Beach. Second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Any further discussion? 
If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Go back to two. Oh, one more time. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. We now move to code revision cases and case number 1624 NN. change between now and this here? The conditions? We have to do more formal training. Like England, we've got the NAS. Right. Here, we actually are doing, We're doing it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We still have a quorum. Yes. Do we do one, two, three, four? Yeah, we have four. Four, four shall. Well, this will be super short, though. How, how long do you think you'll be? Birthday boy needs to make a decision whether he's going to stay or go. <laughs> We're going to sing? No, I said, how long do you think you'll be? He has a birthday party. Oh, not long. Okay. It's quick. <laughs> he's, he's, it's his birthday today. He's Happy got birthday! <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let it go. Please oh. proceed. Okay. We've called um, the case. Go ahead. Okay. This is um, Ann Volsey for the record, planner. Um, this is a city-initiated um, text amendment to section 94-611 definitions, and the code revision case number is 24-03. Um, for the summary, basically, um, chapter 94, um, section 94-611 um, of the city's code of ordinances provides general definitions um, regarding the ZLDRs. Um, this section currently includes definitions relating to FEMA's um, definitions for flood hazard areas um, or development in the flood hazard areas. In 2017, Ordinance 4729-17 placed all necessary flood terms in Chapter 18, Building and Building Regulations of the Code of Ordinances. And basically, this text amendment will, would eliminate um, terms which have been discontinued and are no longer applicable um, to the zoning and land development regulations. So the next few slides are just going to be highlighting um, the definitions that are being deleted and amended. So this is the this first one. This doesn't seem controversial, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first slide. The second one, and like I said before, it's mostly related to um, the construction within the flood um, hazard areas. And lastly, and staff is basically recommend, recommending approval as it complies with section 94-32 amendment standards of the ZLDRs. Okay, very efficient. <laughs> Any questions of staff? Would anyone from the public wish to be heard on this? <laughs> Please, one at a time. <laughs> All right, hearing none, we bring it back to the board. Any concerns? If not, I'm looking for a motion for approval. Okay, I'll try it. I move that the planning board recommend to the city commission approval of code revision case number 24-03, a city initiated request for a text amendment to section 94-611, definitions of the zoning and land development regulations, ZLDRS, removing and modifying definitions relating to development in flood hazard areas. The motion is based upon the testimony presented at the hearing, along with the application submitted and the staff report, which constitutes competent, substantial evidence. The planning board hereby makes findings of fact that the application complies with the required standards in section 94-32A of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations. We have a motion. Have we a second? Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Passes unanimously. I wanted to recognize and sitting in the back there is our new assistant director, Ana Maria Ponte, and we welcome you back. <laughs> <laughs> she's getting ready to leave now. The medication wore off and she's like, why am I here? Okay, that brings us then to other business. Did I call it? question and we did right yes okay good yes. other business unfinished business new business if not we stand adjourned thank you everyone okay
Have a great birthday celebration. Thank you for... <laughs>